Amen, amen. Yeah, time for the word of God. Let's have fun. Amen. Yeah. Um, before we begin today, let me just make a uh, short announcement with the youth conference. I was speaking for myself. So, yeah. So, again, to encourage you guys, yeah. This is our conference, yeah. So we need to we need to prepare ourselves. Yeah. Let's make sure we're doing all we can, going to the presence of God, pray. But above that as well, let's prepare ourselves um, so we can give the best, serve God in the most amazing way. Yeah. So let's take this as the final. It's like I'm going to give my best on this day. Yeah. So let's have the heart as well to. Get ready for the conference and be prepared to serve God with all that we have. Yeah? So, and as well, again, keep, keep, keep inviting other people to come. It is our conference, so we have also to do the, we have to do the marketing ourselves. So we have to invite people, invite all the young people, your friends, your enemies, invite them as well. Everyone, bring them. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so everyone bring them invite them to come this is the day when they can receive the, the transformation so please invite everyone yeah even those you know who don't go to church yeah bring them just tell them to come you, you never know when God can transform their, their lives you never know so this could be their time so let's be bold do the marketing pray do everything yeah, and I haven't seen most of you sharing the leaflet. So we need to, we need to start doing that, yeah? Invite people. And then we're going to see great things in this conference. Amen? Amen. Yeah, let's talk about the Word of God. Um, yeah, the Word of God. Yeah, so the way, the way we're going to do it today, uh, it's going to be very good, interesting. Yeah? So... The monthly topic that we have is this word uh, called restitution. That's the theme for this month. And the goal that we have for this month is to receive back the lost. Yeah, to receive back the lost. And the result that we are looking for at the end of this month is we will learn the love of God towards us by providing the ransom. Now, so this is how... I've broken down this message so it's clear and it makes sense. Yeah? So this is how we're going to do it. First of all, we're going to talk about the, this week's topic, which is mainly about God has provided a ransom for your life. And then in the second part, we're going to talk about, about this word restitution. So what do you get back? Okay? So you've been ransomed, but what do you get back? What do you inherit? So those, that's how we're going to talk about this. So we're going to deal with ransom. Yes, you've been ransomed. Then restitution, this part of getting back what you have lost. We need to deal with that. And I think there's, it's a very interesting um, topic that we need to talk about um, during this time we live in. So part one, we're going to talk about a ransom. First of all, we have questions about that. And the, probably the questions you could, you could raise is, why do, I need, why do I need the ransom? Why? That's a good question as well. That you need, you, need, you need to have an answer for. Yeah? You're telling me that I need the ransom. And by the way, when we talk about ransom, a ransom is like, let's say for instance, if someone was to steal my Bible with my highlights, and then, and then they tell me, oh, for you to get the Bible back, you have to pay £100, which I think I might pay or I might not. So then if I pay the £100, yeah, then that £100 becomes a ransom for my Bible. Now, the, now the theme is telling us, this week's topic is telling us that God has provided a ransom for your life. Now, the question that comes before, after that is, what, what was wrong with me, first of all? Why do I need a ransom? What's the problem? You see, the, the, those, those are good questions um, we need to talk about. And then, when it comes to the restitution part, because restitution means, by the way, it talks about, it's about the return of objects that were stolen or lost. That's the word restitution. So it's getting back what was lost or what was stolen. Okay? Now, 
And the question that comes up after that is this, what did I lose? What do I get back? What did I lose that I'm going to get back? What is it? We need to deal with those ones so we can clarify exactly what we are talking about. Okay? So now, let's begin with part one. So, this week's topic is this. God has provided a ransom for your life. Okay? And the verse we are reading is this. I picked uh, Genesis chapter 22, if we can read all of us together. So Genesis chapter 22, verse 9, I'll begin from verse 9 to verse 13, so we get a little bit of context as well. Okay? So the Bible says, when they arrived at the place where God had told him, which is Abraham, by the way, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son, Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way. For now, I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then verse 13. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thick. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Now that's, that's so interesting. Because the, the story is this. Isaac was, was the one who was going to be sacrificed. was the one who was going to, to die. But instead of him dying, God provided what? A sacrifice, a ransom. So instead of Isaac dying, the ram died in, in his place. Now, as you can see already, this is, a, this, 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 this is an image of what God would do in the New Testament. You see? So you have us as sinners who are supposed to die. And then you have God already. He's going to provide a ransom so you don't have to die. So you can see how these things are working. Okay? So already you can see that just beginning in Genesis, you can already see the picture, what's going on here. Okay? So Isaac is to die, but God provides a ransom. Amen. We also in the New Testament, we have sinned. We have all fallen short of God's glory, which means we are meant to die. But guess what? God provided a ransom. Amen. So now let's walk through this slowly so we can build up understanding when it comes to this. Okay? Now, for us to understand why we need a ransom, first of all, we have to understand the bad news. What does it mean to understand the bad news? For you to appreciate the good news of the kingdom of God or the good news of the New Testament, first of all, you have to have an understanding of the bad news. What's the bad news? And by the way, when you read the book of Romans, this is why the book of Romans is so interesting. Before, 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 before when you read the book of Romans, before he begins to tell you about salvation, first of all, he begins by telling you how all of us, we are sinners, how all of us, we are falling short of God's glory, and then he talks about the good news. So we also as well, as young people, if we are going to appreciate, okay, the good news, if you are going to worship Christ, okay, and thank him for what he has done, we have to understand the bad news. What's the bad news? Okay? Now, the bad news is this. <laughs> and then we're going to talk about the good news. So, when you read Genesis, chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, okay? Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, we know what Adam and Eve did. <laughs> they ate the fruit, okay? Which meant they died. Now, this is the bad news. So you can see that Adam and Eve, they didn't obey God. And God had already said that if you eat, you shall surely die. Okay, now I'm not interested in what happened exactly Whatever Adam and Eve, whatever they did, I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in today is the word, you shall surely die. What do you mean you shall surely die? For me, that's interesting. Because we have to understand. Because when you read the New Testament, there's this word you're going to keep finding. Oh, in Christ we've been made alive. So was I dead? So there's a confusion. 
which needs some clarification. What do you mean by death? What do you mean you shall surely die? And by, by the way, when you, read, when you read what happened in Genesis, okay, did Adam and Eve die at the moment they ate the fruit? No. Because the Bible shows us actually that they live 900 years. Now, then there must be another meaning to this word, you shall surely die. And what's that meaning? Okay, Because this meaning actually is going to help us appreciate the good news that we have in Christ Jesus. Okay? So what do you mean by death? Now, so there are two kinds of death. Okay? One is physical death. Okay? When the soul leaves the body, that's death. Okay? But there's another kind of death, which mostly the Bible is talking about. Okay? That we have to understand. is a spiritual death. Okay? So, spiritual death. Now, the, the, the thing is this now. So, it seems like when you read Genesis, when God told Adam and Eve, the day you eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. What God meant, it's not exactly that you, you're going to die physically, but it was mainly about spiritual death. Okay? That you're going to be spiritually dead. Now, so, for us to understand this concept, yeah, let, let, me, let me give you, let me use this principle to help us understand the, the, this concept of spiritual death. Spiritual death, because it doesn't really make sense, but let me, let me try to use this principle. Probably can help us to build up this understanding. Now, when you read, when you read Genesis chapter 1, okay, there's an interesting thing you're going to find. You'll find that whatever God spoke to, okay, and then the, whatever thing God spoke to, and then whatever created from that thing, for that thing to remain alive has to remain connected to whatever thing it came from. Let me, let me give you an example. God spoke to the land, land to produce trees. Now, for trees to remain alive, they have to remain connected to what? To the soil. You see? So, where did fish come from? From waters. Now, for a fish to remain alive, it has to remain in the water. The moment you take it out of water, you don't need to kill it. It is dead automatically. It's just a matter of time, but it's already dead. Now, when you, when you, where did animals come from? Animals, they came also from earth. That's why animals, they have to keep eating grass. They have to eat, keep eating dead. Why? So they can maintain to be alive. Without that, they also die. Now, with that concept, then it's easy to understand when it comes to spiritual death. What do you mean by spiritual death? Why? Because when you get to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God didn't speak to anything else. He spoke to himself. Let us create a man in our own image. So this, that means this person we're going to create, this one, the material is going to be made from, is God. Which means for this man to remain alive, he has to remain attached to what? To this God. Which means the moment he's detached, he's dead. See? So, that's a good understanding we have, we have to, to remember. So, when the Bible speaks of death, it's not mainly about physical death. It's mainly about this spiritual death, this detachment. Okay? When, when the soul is detached from God, that's death. You, that's, why, that's why the Bible says that we are dead in God. So, all of us, so if, you are, if, if, if a person is living in sin, they are what? Dead. Why? They are separated from God. See? That's very interesting. And the reason why this is interesting, I don't, know, I don't know if you remember the story of Jesus when Jesus was being crucified. Now, this is interesting. Remember Jesus was being beaten. Okay? He was beaten, whatever they did to him. But the Bible tells us that Jesus was quiet all through the process. And then you get to the cross. When he gets to the cross, there's this moment, which seems to be the climax of, 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 of the crucifixion, where, where, where Jesus said, oh, where he cried out. You're going to find this in Mark chapter 15, verse 34. He cried out, and at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, imagine he's been beaten by his quiet. But during this moment, He's the, it's the moment he's crying out. Why? Because he's, the, all, these, all our sins have been put on him. Now, if our sins are, are on him, he's being separated from God. Or God is forsaking him. Why? Because of the sins of us upon him. 
Now, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is this. It's just to understand that, that the greatest death the Bible speaks about is this spiritual, the, the, this spiritual distance from God, this spiritual separation from God. That's the most dangerous death. That one. No wonder why. <laughs> There's this verse I read as well. Jesus said, yeah, that you shouldn't be afraid of people who can kill only the body, but rather fear him who can put your soul into hell. The, the point is this. Most of us, we fear this physical death, but this is not really the most dangerous death. The most dangerous death is being separated from God. That's the dangerous death, actually. That's the one we are to be afraid of. That's the most that's the most horrible death, being separated from God. Now, the question is this. What, 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 separates, what separates a soul from God? Okay? Now, that's easy to answer. Why? Because when you read Genesis, God told, God gave Adam and Eve his command. Okay? The day you eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. Now, it seems like, so for a soul to be separated from God, there's this word that comes in. It's the word called... Sin. Sin means you are rebelling against God's will. Okay? Now, so remember, these souls, our souls, are created from God's material, which means for them to remain alive, we have to remain connected with God. Now, there's this thing. So if you sin, in other words, you declare, in other words, you rebel against God, you are separated from God. That's why when you read Romans, the Bible tell, tells us, the Bible says, the wages of sin is what? Death. It doesn't, it doesn't really mean physical death. It's speaking of this, this, this separation from your soul and God. Okay? So sin is the cause of what? This spiritual death. Sin, okay, is the cause of this spiritual death. Now, so as soon as we have the understanding, okay, because we can see sin, it's what leads to this separation, which means if God deals with sin, the rest is dealt with. Okay? Anyway, let's read, let's read Romans chapter 3, verse, verse, verse 23. A short verse. The Bible says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. So this is just to remind us that all of us have sinned, which means, okay, but according to God's righteous judgment, we all ought to be separated from God. Because why? We've rebelled against him. But the good news is this thing. The good news is this. So even though we've declared independence from God, even though we are se we've been separated from God, even though we've run away willfully from God, God, the good news is this. The good news is this. The good news is that God has provided a ransom for your life. Amen. Okay? You ought to die, but God has provided a ransom for your life. Amen. Now, let me, let me read you this interesting verse. When you read um, John, John chapter 1, verse 29. Interesting verse there. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look! The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Remember that lamb in Genesis? The lamb. Remember the lamb when Isaac was supposed to be sacrificed, but God provided a lamb to die in his place. Now we have another lamb in the New Testament, which God has provided to take away the sin of the world. And this is what we're talking about today. God has provided a ransom for your life. Now, this is the good news then. We had declared independence from God. We had run away from God. We were dead. We were separated from God. But God provided a ransom so we can be back again. So we can be made alive with Christ. And that's why when you read John chapter 3 verse 16, the Bible tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his, his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall never perish, but rather have eternal life. For God so loved the world. So you can see this is an act of love. It's like this. It's like God created us to be with him. And then, and then we, we are the ones who say, no, no, we, away with this God. We don't want God. And then, but God still, because of his love, because of how much he loves us, he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross so we don't have to die. Now tell me, what greater news, what greater good news can you hear except that? 
You tell me. What is it? See? That's the true story. That's the true love story you hear about. That's the, that's the story of the Bible. That even though we ran away from God, God provided a ransom. God provided a ransom. And it's good that we understand that. Why? Because as young people, you're going to hear many, many of your friends telling you these things. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't believe in a God that sends people to hell. No, 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 no. no. Our God doesn't, people, doesn't send people to hell. Actually, he's trying to stop us from going to hell. You see? So, when people, yeah, yeah, God created hell, so I don't, I don't believe in this God. No, 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 no. Actually, God is doing all he can. To, to bring you back, to, to stop you from going to hell. So which means, for a person to go to hell, you, you, you must choose to walk over Jesus. Like, you must choose to go against God so you can go to hell. But our God is a God of love. He has provided a ransom so he can be brought back to God. See, it's a very good thing we understand that. And, and uh, other young people, they are there telling you, yeah, 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 I, I don't believe in your God. Your God created evil. Your God created all this pain. So how can I believe in this God? No, you, do, you don't understand what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we are the ones who used our free will to open doors to all these things. So it's not that God created evil. It's not that God brought pain in this life. No, we are the ones. God gave us this good thing called free will. And then we use it against God. We use this to run away from God. But still, God provided a ransom so it can be brought back to him. Now, you can't stand there with pride, yeah, 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 all this. You, you just don't understand. See, why? Because this is a story of love. Even though we run away from God, God has provided what greater good news can you hear except that? See? There's a, there's a quote I, I read from this book I was reading. It's a good, very good, 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 good quote. He said in his book, Man is now a horror to God and to himself, a creature ill-adapted to the universe, not because God had made him so, but because he has made himself so by the abuse of his free so God, God is not the one who created all this mess. No, we are the one who use our free will to, to open doors to all these things. So you can see that God actually, okay, God could have been, okay, is that what you want? Okay. But guess what? Because of his love. For God so loved the world. But still, he came running after us. He came chasing us. So we can be brought back. This, this, is why, this is why we worship this guy. This is why we thank Jesus. Why? Because there's, there's no man who has such a greater love like Jesus. No one. It is only when you understand about the bad news and then you hear about God's love, now we can appreciate the good news. Okay? Now we can appreciate the good news. Okay? But... This is one thing we have to understand. Okay? Now, so God has provided a ransom not to be eternally separated from God. He has provided a way back into a relationship with him. See? We ran away from God, but God brought us back. Okay? And there's this story. We, we, are, we are like that story. I don't know if you've heard that story of the prodigal son. Okay? This son came to his father. Okay? He's like, you know what? Give me my money. Give me my inheritance. I just want to go and enjoy myself. So God could have been, so the father could have been, okay, go. I don't want you anyway. And don't, don't ever come back. The father could have done that. But guess what? When the son came back, do you know what the Bible tells us? That the father joyfully came and wrapped himself Amen. to the son. Welcome, my son. Welcome back again. And then he killed the best animal so they can celebrate. You can see, that's a pure heart of we have to understand that. Okay? Now, so that's dealt with. Now, there's a second issue that comes with this. So, now, since I've been re restored, since I've been brought back to God, what do I inherit now? Okay? What do I get back? That also needs some clarification. Why? Because we have a lot of things we think, oh, yeah, I'm going to get back what I've lost. But what exactly are you talking about? Because we have to make sure that our views matches what the Bible teaches. Because most of the time, we find ourselves, we have these ideas that are not biblical. Okay? So we need to deal with this issue. So what do you get back? What do you inherit in Christ Jesus? So now, let's read this verse, and then we're going to talk from this one. Okay? So, but when the right time came, Galatians chapter 4, 
verse 4 to 7. I just want to read this verse just to establish, okay? The Bible says, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 to, to, to 7. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our heart, prompting us to call out Abba, Father. Verse 7 then. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Now, that, that's interesting. Now, because we're getting some verses here talking about that. that, 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 that there are things you've inherited now since you've been brought back. Okay, so the Bible is telling us that we are no longer slaves. Okay, now we are children, and therefore we are a man. Okay, we are we are there are things we're going to inherit. Okay, or let's read this verse as well. Ephesians chapter three verse six. The Bible says, just I'll quote the last part. It says that both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Now. There's an, interesting, there's an interesting thing about these verses. Because you're telling me that as soon as I've been redeemed, as soon as I've been ransomed, as soon as I've been brought back into relationship with God, there are things I have inherited. That there are riches now I am going to share equally. Now, there's a question about that. What are those riches? What are they? That needs clarification as well. Oh, when do you get these riches? What are they? Is it, is it, are we talking about... Good cars. Why exactly? We, we need clarification from the Bible. What do we mean by these riches we have in Christ Jesus? Okay. We need to uh, have an understanding of this. Now, before, 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 before we can talk about exactly these riches, I want to give you free, free views when it comes to these riches. Okay? I'm going to talk about two, two views, actually, that are not biblical. And then we're going to talk about what the Bible teaches. Okay? So, See, just see what I'm going to talk about here. Now, when it comes to these riches, so now that you've been ransomed, now that there, there, there are these riches you inherit in Christ, in Christ Jesus, there are things that there's a, there's a view, there's a, there's a theology that comes into this. Now, there's a, there's a theology called that the poverty gospel. Okay? Now, the poverty gospel goes like this. It says that, that oh yeah, yeah, having material wealth, having all these things, it's a sin. So therefore, as a, as a Christian, you ought to get rid of anything. Don't, don't have anything at all. You just ought to be just, just that, like that. Don't use anything. Yeah, just having money, money is evil, all these things. Okay? Now, that's a, that's a theory out there, by the way. So, that one is wrong. Why is it wrong? Why? Because when you read the Bible, the Bible tells us that we are to work so we can provide for the needs of others. Now, how are you going to provide for the needs of others if you don't have anything to provide for them for? You can see that, according to the Bible, actually, we are supposed to work, obviously, and we are supposed to help others. Okay? Now, so this theory that teaches that oh, you are meant to be poor, so in, in, in other words, what you inherit in Christ Jesus is just poverty. You're supposed to be poor for the rest of your life. Now, that's wrong. Okay? That's very wrong. Now, but I don't want to dwell on that because we don't have many people who have that theory these days. There's a second issue. There's a second view. Which I, need, which, which I need to talk about, okay? Now, when people run away from this theory or this theology of poverty, there's another gospel they go to. And this gospel as well is equally wrong as well, okay? And this is where most young people, and by the way, the reason why this is dangerous is because most of the, most of the famous preachers we listen to, that's the gospel they teach. And what, what is it called? It's called the prosperity gospel as well. So, people come from here, yeah, you're not meant to be in poverty, of course. That's refuted. That's not according to the Bible. Now, straight away, they come into another wrong as well. They think that these riches we have in Christ Jesus is just material wealth. Now, is that what the Bible teaches as well? See? So, we need to, we, we need to check about these, 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 these teachings we, we get from, uh, from, from, many, from many people. Okay? So, people coming from that, they jump to this other thing called prosperity gospel. Why is this prosperity gospel? So it's a theology and movement based on the belief that God wants to reward you with, 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 with wealth, with cars, with houses. So in other words, for them, they think that the riches we have in Christ Jesus is just good houses, is just cars, is just all these things. But is that really what the Bible teaches? 
That really what the Bible teaches. Why? Because there's a, there, there's, a, there, there's a lot of problems that comes with that. Why? Because you, you, when you read the Bible, you don't find, okay, when you read the, mainly the New Testament, actually, okay, you don't find where God is saying that the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus, it's blah, 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 car, did, 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 all these things. So where do we get these things from? Actually, when you check carefully, you find that most of us, because of our desires, our fleshly desires, or probably from our society, which is driven by external success, we also think, we also think that, oh, God means, oh, what God means I'm going to inherit is also these good riches, this money, or this car. Really, is that what the Bible teaches? Okay, could it be probably we are using the world standard, okay, and then we apply it to the Bible as well? Could it be? So we need to think about this exactly. Okay. Now, the, 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 of course, for every for every for every wrong, by the way. Okay. The, the, there's a piece of truth. Okay. Which, by the way, so <laughs> this is what happens. Okay. So don't think. Do you know the reason why many people swallow swallow lies? Don't, don't think it's because it comes applied to as a lie. No, it's because on top of it, there's a bit of truth, but behind it, there's a lie. So most people they just swallow and they don't know what they are swallowing actually. It's a complete lie. Now, so what I mean by this is what? Is we need to check this, this, this theory of prosperity gospel. We need to check it out. Okay, because you, you're going to find many people who have these sayings. And by the way, even myself was beginning to adopt some of these, some of these, these sayings. But let's, let's, let's test these sayings, okay? So one of them goes like this. It goes like this. Yeah, we are to live like the king's kid. Okay. Is that really bad? Not really. Okay? You are to live a God's king. But what do you mean by that statement? Okay? But for the prosperity gospel, what they mean by that is what? Is you are meant to be what? To be bathed in wealth. <laughs> you see? That, that's what they mean. They mean material wealth. They mean what? So for them, the riches we inherited in Christ Jesus, for them it's only material wealth. We need to check that. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Is that really what the Bible teaches? Now, if you, are to live by, if you are to live as a God's king, okay, and it means for you, for whatever the prosperity goes for, and it means you are supposed to believe in this, 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 <laughs> this luxurious lifestyle, if that's what it means, okay, let's, let's check Jesus. Hmm. So now, Jesus was the king's kid. Now, is the, do, do we hear in the Bible that Jesus owned uh, this, 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 he, he won the land in Galilee where people were coming and then he was getting all this money? No. Or the apostles. Do we hear about them owning a whole, a whole land so they have all this, or they are living in this, this they are bathed in this wealth? No, we don't find that in the Bible. But what we find is this, okay? When you read Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 11, the Bible says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. What's that attitude? Verse 6, though he was God, he did not think of the equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. So you can see what the Bible is speaking about here. Okay? The king's kid. This is, this is the king's way of living. It's that even though we have all these riches, okay, but we, 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 we become servants. <sighs> yeah, interesting now. Okay? So now, so this view that that, that a good Christian, if you, are, if you are in good relationship with God, you are meant to be bathed in this wealth, in this riches, that's not biblical. Why? Because when you read the apostles, when you read Jesus, you find the blessings they talk about, it's not really material wealth. It's not really physical wealth. They are speaking of other blessings. It's just that for us, driven by our, our, our motivation speakers, all these things, we think everything it has to be success. It has to be material wealth. But that's not really what the Bible teaches. When you read Romans, Romans chapter 8 verse 17, the Bible says, since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But we are to share his glory. No, sorry. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. <laughs> now, this is, this is contrary to the prosperity gospel. Okay? Prosperity gospel, they tell you that, okay, you have all these riches in Christ Jesus. And that means, yeah, you're supposed to have a nice car. You're supposed to have good houses. You're supposed to have, yeah, some of us, yeah, good wives, good husbands. <laughs> everything is there, okay? So, everything we've made it into material stuff. 
Okay? But when you read the Bible, the Bible, Romans chapter 8, verse 17, it's telling us now, we are his heirs. Okay? That means we are his heirs. And then the Bible says, but if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Which means that now, in this life now, it's not, it's not really, it's, you're not really, get, you're not really get going to get those things. Those riches. Oh, probably. You're going to get them from other, other way than what, than what this prosperity gospel pro proposes. Anyway, let's, let's continue down. Okay? Now, so you can see already that this view, that these riches are purely just material and you are meant to be bathed in wealth since you are a Christian, all these things, that's not biblical at all. Okay? Now, there's still a question. Um, <laughs> there's a, this is why you're going to find many Christians. Okay? But when they have problems, they get disappointed in God. Why? Because their view of Christianity is that everything is going to be shiny since I am God's, God's kid. Now, that's really wrong. Why? Because you, when you read John, you find Jesus. Jesus, whenever I read the Bible, I get shocked most of the time. Jesus is saying, imagine Jesus, if, let's say for someone who wants to gain followers, okay? I would have kept promising you, oh, guys, you're going to have success. You're going to enjoy life. Life is going to be good. But Jesus was not saying that. He's telling them that, that you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be hated. You're going to have all these problems. And then he says, I am telling you this, so when it happens, you won't be disappointed. You see, this is a different gospel from what these prosperity gospels are teaching. <laughs> we need to work on this, this understanding. Okay? So you can see that whatever these riches we have inherited in Christ, it has nothing to do with material success. This is just our culture driven mentality. And then we take that, we bring into the Bible, we find verses that support this mentality, and then we walk away thinking, oh, God has also promised you a nicer house, a nicer car, a Tesla. I already have a... <laughs> no, that's not exactly what the Bible is talking about. And there's, a, there's another logic. And by the way, for me, I was beginning to buy into this one until, 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 until God corrected me on this one. I think you've heard this saying as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Since we are Christ as ambassadors, yeah, I must be bathed in good success, wealth. It's the same thing, the same mentality. Okay? Yeah, I'm a Christ as ambassador. So therefore, yeah, good this. Everything must be blah, blah, blah. Good, good, good. Okay? But, and, then, and then one day, I was sitting there. I came here during the week and I was reading the Bible. And I read, I read, this, I read this verse in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 19. This verse messed in my head. Okay? The Bible says, this is Paul, pray also for me that whenever I speak, what may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery, the mystery, the mysteries of the gospel. For which, I, this is the line, for which I am an, I am an ambassador in chains. Now, that verse spinned my head. Because <laughs> for me, I think, okay, according to the prosperity gospel, yeah, I am a God's ambassador, so therefore, material wealth, success, all these good things, okay? Then I have Paul here. He's saying that he's an ambassador of Christ in chains. Now, mm, Paul, what was wrong with you? <laughs> you see? But actually, what's wrong with us? Because we have a complete and biblical views of these riches we've inherited in Christ. Does that make sense? <laughs> so, whatever, whatever, by the way, my point is this, okay? Whatever this view that we have inherited material wealth, success, they did all these things, that's not really biblical. Now, does that mean, does that mean that God cannot bless you financially? No, God can still bless you financially. He can bless you in, in material wealth. But don't make it your theology that th these are the blessings I've inherited in Christ. Okay? That, that, that's, that's the point I'm arguing against. Okay? God can prosper you. God can give you money. God can give you all these things. But don't think, oh yeah, this is, this is, this is my final blessings. This is what I am to focus on. The, no, because well, when you read the Bible, Paul's, there's, a, there's a thing where the, Paul says that we are running for a prize that is no what. That, 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 this, 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 are, this is a prize, okay? That is what? That is eternal. Th th these are things that are not going to be finished with this life. That, that cannot be destroyed. Okay? Now you can see with the prosperity gospel, they are running toward things that can be destroyed. And that's not really what we are called for. And that's not what we inherit in Christ. Okay, what we've inherited are these riches that cannot be destroyed. Now, what are they still? It's still the question we need to, to, to dig with. 
But one thing you have to remember, all those sayings here yeah, in Christ, they, 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 I'm supposed to be buffed in well for these things. Yeah, you need to check those, those, those theologies because they are not really, they are not really uh, biblical. Okay? Now, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thing we need to talk about then. Okay? So, Shandrak, now. So, w- are, you, are you telling us we're not supposed to be wealthy? We are not supposed to enjoy good health? All these things. No. God can bless you with them. But it shouldn't be your primary focus. That's not your focus. That's not what you're looking at. Okay, why? Because this, this, these things of this life, the Bible tells us, are finishing. Okay? But we are waiting for much better things that are not seen. Okay? So, don't reduce these things into this. Okay? So, we need to shift our eyes. Okay? And don't look, okay? Don't look at, at the world and then interpret the world as, and view the world as what the world sees the world. No. We need to view the world according to what the Bible teaches. Okay? So, there's a, there's a good thing here then, okay? Because some of us, okay? Because I, I had to deal with those, 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 those theologies um, so we can put them on the side. Now, there's an interesting thing, okay? So, most of us, we have come to define the best lifestyle, okay? As what? As, as when you are bathed into wealth. But, again, th- there's always a thing as Christians we have to be careful of, okay? Is that how the Bible defines the best life? How does God define the best life? How does God define the best life? Now, if you read the Bible carefully, you're going to find that the Bible is contrary to what the, to what the world teaches. No wonder why. When you read, I think, John chapter 4, <laughs> John said that if we Christians, if we teach things according to the biblical world, people of the world, they are going to hate us. They are, going, they are not going to understand us. Now, I never really understood that, but now I appreciate that. Now, now it makes sense. Why? Because... The, these teachings of the Bible, what the Bible teaches, it's actually contrary to what the world teaches. Now, we have, you have most of us, our teachers are mainly people of the world. And then we call ourselves Christians. Now you can see that you can be a Christian, but you are running with what? Teachings based on the worldview of the world, not on biblical worldview. Now, we have to always check. What does the Bible mean with a best life? Is, is it, okay, does the best life mean you have to have all these successful things? Or the, is that really what the Bible defines as the best life? No. When you read the Bible carefully, there's a thing that God prizes the most. And that is obedience to his will. If, if, even if you live in poverty, even if you live where, but you obey God, before God, you're actually, you're actually the best person to him. But again, if you have this prosperity gospel in your head, or you just think the best life is when you have all these things, so if you, if you don't have these things, you think there's something wrong with you. No, something's wrong with you if you are not living in obedience with God. But as long as you're living in obedience with God, there's nothing wrong with you at all. Amen. Even if the world can look at you and think you're crazy, and think you don't make sense, as long as you are walking with God, as long as you are with God, as long as you're obeying God, Amen. that's all you need. That's the best lifestyle, Amen. according to the Bible. Okay? So, more than just seeking all these things, running after these things, we need to look after, actually, we need to seek God and obeying Him. Yes. That should be our focus. That should be our focus. Because why? Because that's how God defines the best life. Oh, most of us think, yeah, the best life is when I'm sacrificing all these things. No, God does not desire our sacrifices. God, first of all, He, he, he wants you, first of all, to live in obedience to Him. Obedience is better than sacrifice. I see? So most of us, we think if I have this money, then I'm going to work for God. No. If, if, if that's not what God called you for, you're really making a mistake. Okay? First of all, go after God. He'll visit to you His will. Then you go after that. So it's the opposite. I see? So most of us, this is the problem with most of our young people, because we listen to these motivation speakers. We've also written all these goals. Yeah. One goal. I want to have this. I have this, and we have these vision boards. I've read books about this, by the way. These vision boards. And the vision boards are full of just material stuff. Nothing, n- nothing with God. Not really. Is that really what you should be doing as a Christian? You can see, these are all issues of what? They are coming from that prosperity. Gospel. The moment you check what, how God defines the best lifestyle, now you can take your vision board, put that away. You go to God, he gives you what to vision about. See? <laughs> we, need, we, we, need, we need to adjust our mentalities when it comes to this. 
Okay, we need to adjust our 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 thing. There's there's a question the Holy Spirit one day asked me. He was he was he was telling me, could it be? Okay, think about this. Assess yourself. Could it be your your drive to have a lot of money, expensive cars, expensive houses? Could it be? It is driven by merely because you want to impress people, not because you want to serve God. Could it be? Think about it. For me, I assess myself. I find out. I was, well, I was really after impressing people. It was not really so I can represent God. No, it was really just to impress people so people can think, yeah, 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 you know that guy Shandrak? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got something. You see? Why? So I want to impress? I want to impress people. You see? So you can see that these drives we have, oh yeah, vision boards, whatever millions, whatever billions, whatever these these things, most of the time, really, they are not really driven because you want to represent Christ. No. Most if you check carefully, if you assess yourself, it's driven by your desire to impress people. Now, after you've assessed yourself now, you can bring yourself down now. Come to God. As God. And by the way, there's a question, there's another question the Holy Spirit asked me. He said, Who defines the lifestyle of an ambassador? Is it the ambassador himself or the country that sent him? The country that sent him. You see this? You see? So you are not the one who, who's supposed to write, Oh, yeah, I'm supposed to live this lifestyle. No. God, who's the one who sent you? He's the one who, who assigns. Now, He can assign you like Paul to represent Christ in prison. Okay? Now, you're supposed to go there with a good heart. Why? Because you are his ambassador. All that you want is just to represent him. Now, the problem we have, we have with most people is this. God, some of us, God is like, yeah, I want you to go there. No, 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 God. I want to go here. <laughs> Two million in account. You, you can see the problems we have. Now, really, are you, do you really want to represent Christ or you just want things to impress people? What is it you want? As, we need to assess ourselves. We need to assess ourselves. You see? And by the way, be careful with these success-driven things. Because why? Because, again, by the way, think about this. People of the world, what they think is success is what? It's material wealth. Now, how can you tell me you as a believer as well, okay? You're also going to subscribe to that vision of success. How? It doesn't work. Now, you can learn from them. There's this book I read, that book, Think and Grow Rich. <laughs> now, now recently, recently, I was thinking about this. Because the guy, the, the guy, it's a good book, by the way. Read the book. It's a, it's a good book. But there's a, there's a quote I remember read from the book. He said that if you want to become a millionaire, you have to have, you, you, you have to be conscious, you have to be success conscious. What he means is this, in your mind, you have to fill your mind with money. You have to desire to have money, okay? And then you're going to get money. Now, recently, the Holy Spirit was telling me, but you are my ambassador now. Are you also going to fill your mind, you're going to be conscious with money? Or are you going to be conscious with my plan? For your life. What are you going to do in this case? Why are you going to do in this case? So you can see now that this requires that we push away these things so we can live according to God's plan. This is so, so interesting. So interesting. But whatever, one thing to remember is this. Whatever these riches we have in Christ Jesus, it has nothing to do with material success. It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with them. Why? Because if, 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 if having material wealth meant that you were actually blessed by God, then Jesus was cast, Paul was cast, the apostle was cast. But we know they actually they were the most blessed people. Even though they didn't have material wealth, they had other riches. There are other riches. What are these riches? Let, let's talk about this quickly. Okay? So, these riches... <laughs> Let me go quick, because for the sake of time. Okay? Now, what do we inherit in Christ Jesus? What is it, Shandrach? Let's talk about this. Okay? Now, when you read Luke chapter 12, verse 29 to verse 32. I hope it's the right um, one. Uh, the Bible says, 32 actually, Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Do not be afraid, little frog, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. You see? So, rather than thinking, oh, God has given me money, I am to inherit all these things. No, you have to think that you've inherited the entire kingdom of God. That's what you have to think about. That's what you have to worry about. That's why when you read Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, there's an interesting, there's an interesting, interesting parable that Jesus said. He was saying that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. That when a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went 
and sold all he had and bought the field. And then he said again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. The concept is this, okay? The moment you understand what the kingdom of God has, actually, you should sell everything because this thing has everything. Amen. You see the concept here? Okay? So, we are supposed actually to leave everything so we can have this. Why? Because this comes with everything we are looking for. Amen. Now, you, you, you can try to w w work for money Work for this, go for this. But are you rather going to go for this, focus on this, and then the kingdom of God and the Christ and God provides for you? What, what are you going to do? And that's why when you read Matthew chapter 6, verse 53, the Bible says that seek first what? Money. No. <laughs> the Bible says seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things are going to be added. You see? So, for us then, we are to go there. Seek God. Seek the kingdom of God. Go after God. Whatever he wants you to serve him, you serve him right there. And then he promises that he's going to provide everything. That's good. Now, let, let me read you one more verse. I, I guess you're not tired of me yet. <laughs> so, let, let me read you. There's a story I read today. I love this, okay? Read, look. Let's go to look, okay? About the prodigal son, okay? I, 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 read, I read the good, a good verse there. I just want to talk about this, and then, and then we can, and then obviously we can finish. Um, Luke chapter 15, um, verse, verse 32, okay? Let me, let me read you this one, because it's, 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 going to give the, it's going to give a summary to what we've talked about today. So Luke chapter 15 about the prodigal son, okay? Now, I'm not going to read the whole story, obviously. We don't have time, okay? But let me give you, let me give you like, a, 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 like a, a, a review so we understand each other, okay? So you have this father who had two sons. And one of the sons, he's like, okay, father, give me my thing. Give me my wealth. Give me everything. And guess what he did? He went away. And then when he went away, all the wealth he had finished, okay? He got broke. And then he went and he was eating pig food. And then he came, so one day he thought, oh, you know what? How come I'm living in this poverty when my father and servant in my father's house, they are eating, they are enjoying life. So guess what? He came back to his father. Now, when we, when we listen to this story, most of us, we just focus on the prodigal son. But we don't think about the son who stayed at home. Why? Because there's an interesting verse, a good verse I read today, which is very interesting. Now, let's read Luke chapter 15, verse 25. Because remember, remember, when the prodigal son came, okay, God, the father provided a party, okay? For a party, yeah, come, let's enjoy ourselves, okay? Now, when the older son, now, the Bible says now. So, meanwhile, the older son was in the field, walking. When he returned home, he heard musicians dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants, what was going on? Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. He has, he celeb you were celebrating because of his safe return. Verse 28. The other brother was angry. Now, I want you to focus on this brother. <laughs> focus on this brother, okay? The, the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've, I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet, when this son of yours comes back from squander after squandering your money on, prostitu on prostitutes, you celebrate by carrying the, f the fattened calf. Verse 31 then. <laughs> His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. So then, the point is this, okay? It's like, it's like the father is telling the son, I don't need to give you this, I don't need to give you this. Why? You have everything. And that's why when you, when you check Paul, Paul was saying in, in 1 Corinthians, he said, that we, we, uh, I don't remember this verse. Let me check this one. Uh, there, there's a good verse where Paul said, he said something very, very interesting. He said that, we, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. He said, we own nothing, and yet we have everything. What do you mean? We own nothing, and yet we have 
everything. Now you can see. Remember the, 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 pro, the parables we read in Matthew chapter 13. Why? This is the treasure that contains everything. Now, the, our great inheritance, what we inherit in Christ Jesus, is not money, it's not these things. We inherited the kingdom of God, and this kingdom comes with everything. Now, uh, instead of us pursuing these things, we should be pursuing these things. That's why there's one more verse I need to read you guys. <laughs> yeah, no, this one is interesting. Now, when you read, when you read, um, when you read, when you read Philippians, there, there's, a, there's a good verse there. Philippians chapter 3. Okay? Philippians chapter 3, uh, verse. And then, yeah. Philippians, and then we can finish with this. Okay, Philippians chapter three. I, I, lo I love this this verse. I, I've got to read this. Okay, Philippians chapter three. Let's begin from verse seven. The Bible says, the Bible says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done for me. And then verse eight. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting, e counting all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ. Now, this, this is a different view. You can see that Paul understood something. Okay? These are the things, useless. I need to go after him. And in him, that's where everything is included. Amen. In him, that's where everything is is included. And then verse 10. I love verse 10. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. But for us it's this. Yeah, I want to have money. I want, no, Paul is like, I want to experience Christ. You can see that in Christ, that's where everything you need. That's where it's included. And by the way, remember the principle we talked about, by the way. Okay? What's the greatest thing you can give a fish outside of water? Is to put it back? In water. It's the same thing. The greatest thing God can give you is no money. It's no cars. The greatest thing God can give you is to give you himself. Why? Because he's the greatest good you can ever have. Why? Because he comes with everything. Hallelujah. Yeah, let's stand up. Let's pray. Yeah? Yeah. So, in conclusion to this message, okay? So God has provided a ransom for our lives, okay? We've been redeemed, thank God. But now, the riches we've gained in Christ, it's not material wealth. We've gained the kingdom. And the kingdom and Christ comes with everything. And therefore, instead of pursuing these things, let's pursue God. Let's go after God. Let's experience God. Let's experience Christ. And through Him, and we're going to get everything else that has been promised to us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this wonderful word of yours, oh Papa, that has come to challenge us, oh God. That has come to shift our understanding, oh God. That we are not supposed to run after things, but rather we are supposed to seek the kingdom of God first and your righteousness, oh Papa, and everything else we need. It's going to be added to us, oh Papa. So I pray for every young person in this place, oh God. I pray the Lord God, Papa. God, I pray. Help us seek you first, oh Papa. Help us, oh King of Kings. Run after you, King of Kings, oh Papa. Lord, instead of making overtimes to run after money, but rather make overtimes running after you, Papa. Reading the Bible, searching for you, desiring to grow in Christ, to know Christ even more. Because that's what the Bible tells us. That we are to grow deep and, 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 and show in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Papa. Lord, we thank you, Papa. Lord, we pray the Lord. Let this word of God, let it bring transformation in our minds. Let it bring transformation in our lifestyle. Let it bring transformation, oh God. Lord, I pray the Lord God, Papa. Lord, those goals we had, oh Papa, help us destroy them and rather give, give us your goals, oh Papa. What's your plan? What's your purpose? What, what, what the things you want us to pursue in this life, oh King of Kings, so we can save you the best. We thank you, Papa. We bless you, my King. Hallelujah.
Yeah, let's ask Mama Pastor to bless us as we go home. Hallelujah. the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship with the Holy Spirit be with you all in the name of Jesus Christ clap your hands for the servant of God God bless you God bless the sweet and beautiful girl who tells us God bless you all let us welcome the second service oh God bless you Amen <laughs>